endocrine aspects of COVID-19 and uh, we'll be uh, discussing a lot of data which is available uh, now since you know uh, COVID-19 has been around for a while there's a lot of data which has been generated on this topic uh, so let's start with the obvious that is diabetes and COVID-19 and first let's look at diabetes and immunity now when COVID-19 first uh, you know broke down broke up you know uh, there are a lot of uh, you know concerns about uh, a particular subset of patients who are highly vulnerable to mortality and uh, the, those with diabetes hypertension and cardiovascular disease were predominant amongst this group of uh, uh, patients who you know especially from China and Italy where the death rates were pretty high uh, what was the reason why you know uh, diabetes patients have uh, you know higher mortality well uh, to be very you know uh, straightforward i think you'd say that poorly controlled diabetes mellitus uh, weakens the innate immunity and you'll hear a lot about innate immunity today in my talk uh, because you know that is something you know which is impacted by uh, you know a uh, lot of these endocrine disorders and that is what ultimately leads to uh, enhanced mortality now we all know this you know anybody who has practiced uh, you know endocrinology uh, internal medicine uh, infectious disease pulmonology critical care would all know this that when you have a diabetes when you have a patient with diabetes mellitus and when you have a viral infection over on top of that it leads to poor outcome i remember i, I used to be a uh, you know md resident in medicine when the h1n1 infection broke out and i remember very very clearly in my mind that you know when a diabetic patient would show up for admission we were very uh, you know concerned because those these those patients were really at a higher risk of high mortality so any viral infection when combined with diabetes mellitus is something which leads to poor outcome uh, if you see the cdc data on this and you can see the reference below the cdc data actually showed that patients with diabetes had 50 percent higher mortality than non-diabetic patients which is quite alarming so uh, you know and, and you know the data like this really you know uh, is very concerning for patients uh, who are living in hot spots like Ahmedabad is a hot spot for now and you know a lot of patients who come with a lot of anxiety uh, because of these uh, potential concern of, of this. Uh, now let's look at what is the contribution of the virus itself to the hyperglycemia. Now SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, interestingly can lead to new onset of diabetes and can worsen the existing hyperglycemia which is very interesting. So you know you have a virus here which can actually induce uh, hyperglycemia which is quite uh, uh, you know remarkable and why you know we came to know about this because there are certain patients uh, in Italy who first presented with DK with diabetic ketoacidosis which is very interesting so there were patients who were already pre-existing diabetics both type 1 and ketosis prone type 2 diabetics but you know there were also new onset patients who presented for the first time with diabetic ketoacidosis which is quite interesting we have seen this happen with certain other viruses we also see this very commonly in viral infections secondly to post transplant patients and this is something which is again very novel uh, and something very interesting we've seen in covid 19 patients remember the virus itself can lead to beta cell dysfunction again this is known to happen with multiple viruses and covid 19 seems to be in one of the list of those viruses uh, the insulin resistance also is interestingly increased and again uh, quoting the reference below uh, this reference was actually this is a lancet paper which was more of a positional more of a you know expert opinion and some of the senior endocrinologists in this paper actually said that the insulin resistance was disproportionate to the other infections they had seen in their life you know this is one of the most severe hyperglycemia cases they had seen uh, in their own practice and these are mainly doctors from the Europe where which was which is really badly hit in terms of COVID-19 uh, some patients with diabetes and COVID were found to have very high insulin requirement again uh, we have seen this in post transplant patients with infection and again I reiterate that this is something which we have seen before but for the first time we are seeing this with a de novo infection right something like COVID-19 which is quite interesting so you know uh, across the series of our lectures we are going to have a couple of audience polls we'll discuss the results at the end but I would like to know your experience what has been your experience with diabetes and COVID-19 have you seen higher morbidity have you seen higher mortality I'm sure you would have seen both in some cases you know none or you're not very sure uh, you can please vote for this uh, the link would have been provided to you okay so going ahead another very important system which has been uh, in uh, you know a lot of limelight 
since COVID-19 first broke up was the RAS system that is renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, you know, I think if one system really connects a pulmonologist with an endocrinologist is the RAS system because you know you'd realize that you know we all know this you know I, I'm sure uh, in second year of our MBBS you all learned that ACE inhibitors lead to dry cough it's a very very well known frequently asked question in our exams right so the RAS system does have a link with both pulmonology and endocrinology and this is true pulmocrinology now one again something you hear a lot about these days is ACE2 now, ACE2 is an enzyme, but it acts like a receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. You know, when you see the picture of a COVID-19 virus, you see those spike proteins, they bind with the ACE2. And that is, you know, one of the key elements, right? Uh, again, one thing very interesting is that ACE2, what is one very important physiological role which ACE2 has is that it reduces angiotensin 2 levels in the body. Now, angiotensin 2 is bad for everyone it's bad for the lungs it is bad for the kidney it is bad for the vasculature right and angiotensin 2 has been impact you know implicated in causing lung injury right this is well known it leads to acute lung injury uh, you know adverse myocardial remodeling all these things have been known to occur with angiotensin 2 and ACE2 is actually protective so it reduces angiotensin 2 levels now what happens is when SARS-CoV-2 binds with the ACE2 it reduces the ACE2 level and hence it increases the level of angiotensin 2 creating a situation of more lung injury and this is one of the pathophysiological mechanisms which has been implicated in causing more uh, lung injury because of this virus and as far as diabetes is concerned acute hyperglycemia interestingly increases ACE2 expression hence increasing the viral uptake you know we all understand survival of the fittest and you know it's very interesting it, it actually makes sense for the virus to produce hyperglycemia because it enhances ACE2 expression and hence enhances the viral uptake which is quite remarkable. Whereas chronic hyperglycemia as you see in a lot of our diabetic patients actually down regulates ACE2. Now do you say that this would on the other hand uh, you know reduce the risk of infection but on the other hand seeing the negative side of it this removes the protective ability of this enzyme ACE2 level as we saw actually protects the lung injury uh, uh, protects the you know reduces the angiotensin 2 level to protect the lung and hence you know chronic hyperglycemia so a diabetic patient developing a SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID-19 infection would lead to higher risk of lung injury again increase of angiotensin 2 and this is a practical point a lot of you would be managing patients with COVID uh, you need to understand that the increase of angiotensin 2 also increases aldosterone which produces hypokalemia and what is the other thing which produces hypokalemia insulin so when you are giving insulin to these patients always check the potassium levels remember hypokalemia can be dangerous and especially in critically ill patients and there is something you need to really watch out for now one of the therapies which has been suggested very interestingly is recombinant ACE2 which has been proposed to reduce the risk of lung injury in patients with SARS-CoV-2 there are some ongoing trials for this now you'd ask me ACE2 is it a, is it really a villain or is it a hero you know when you give a recombinant ACE2 what happens is that the virus binds with this decoy uh, receptor instead of binding with the true receptor in the human body and hence it prevents viral uptake at the same time the ACE2 reduces the angiotensin 2 levels hence protecting from lung injury so this is one of the therapies which has been proposed to prevent further lung injury what about ACE inhibitors and ARBs and these are common antihypertensives that we use in clinical practice what should we do about that now some animal studies have shown that ACE inhibitors increases ACE2 levels but this has not been replicated in all studies i repeat this this has not been replicated in all studies there were a lot of concerns about ace2 uh, uh, you know ace inhibitors being a problem in a lot of these patients however this is only theoretical concern the protective effects of ace inhibitors in terms of cardiovascular protection and some other clinical benefits outweigh the risk of potential viral entry and this should be kept in mind and hence all the guidelines at this point of time suggest not to stop ACE inhibitors in your patients if the patient has already been taking it. On the other hand, you have angiotensin receptor blocker act on the angiotensin 281 receptor. So it reduces the action of angiotensin 2. So theoretically, again, it should be protective and it should protect from lung injury. Perhaps ARBs can reduce the risk of severe lung injury caused by virus. Again, there are ongoing studies for that, very interestingly. But unfortunately, the studies will take a long time for the results to come. And, you know, uh, at this point of time, we are not very sure whether th this is seen. But ARBs theoretically can reduce the risk of severe lung injury. 
So should we switch our patients from ACE inhibitor to ARB? Well, that's an interesting question, but unfortunately, we do not have clear data at this point of time. So again, this comes to our audience question. Let's say your patient is living in one of the red zones or hotspots and he's on ACE inhibitor and he's well educated and reads about this in the newspaper. What would you do to the patient? Would you continue the ACE inhibitor as an antihypertensive? Would you change from ACE inhibitor to ARBs? Would you change from ACE inhibitor to some other antihypertensive other than ARB? Uh, please answer this and, and uh, we'll of course, uh, you know, we'd be love, we'd love to discuss this when, uh, you know, the results come out. Okay. So unfortunately, it is too early right now and only theoretical to switch your patients from ACE inhibitors to ARBs. But this could be a potential option, which, you know, because a lot of the things which ACE inhibitors and ARBs are very similar in terms of their benefits. And hence, this could be a potential idea which could be used. Uh, one more drug, you have to be a little careful. Pioglitazone also independently, you can see the reference down. This reference was in 2014, right? Way before the, uh, you know, COVID-19 broke out. Uh, pioglitazone is also known to upregulate the ACE2 level. So, you know, again, if your patient has been on pioglitazone, well, this is something, you know, uh, which you should take care. Uh, what about obesity? Again, one very major concern was that obese patients uh, used to, you know, uh, have a higher mortality, which has been clearly seen across the world. And, you know, there is some relation there. Now, obesity increases leptin levels, which is a pro-inflammatory marker and reduces adiponectin, which is an anti-inflammatory system right and obesity is itself a situation of low grade inflammation and when you have an existing low grade inflammation you worsen it by putting a viral infection on top of it so uh, again there is a reduction of innate immunity again like i told you i promised you that you'll hear a lot about innate immunity and enhancement of the adaptive immunity increasing the risk of a developing a cytokine storm which is one of the major again major reasons for uh, poor outcomes in some of these patients uh, a study which is done from seattle uh, very interestingly, a small study though, but very remarkable results. Uh, obese patients were 85% more likely to require a ventilator and 62% higher risk of mortality. Uh, this is a study published in New England Journal of Medicine. So not to be taken lightly, uh, you know, obese patients are more likely to have poor outcome. And this is, this is something which is, uh, you know, uh, underwritten. Uh, of course, there are several reasons why this could be apart from the immunity mechanisms. Uh, there could be respiratory dysfunction. You have pulmonologists today, and we'll be also discussing about syndrome Z and syndrome X. Uh, and you know, you all know that there is impaired respiratory mechanisms for patients with obesity. Uh, there is increased airway resistance. Uh, you know, again, you have problem when you are putting these patients on ventilator. They have poor outcomes on that, right? Of course, there will be other comorbidities like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, etc., which would increase the risk of these patients from dying. Let's look at now we talked about the obvious ones and let's now look at some of the you know other organs uh, of the endocrine system which could be potentially impacted right now let's talk about the pituitary gland and uh, this there's, there's going to be a dedicated talk on this but I'll just you know uh, give you a brief outcome to this uh, so there is something known as post SARS sickness syndrome now this was seen with the earlier SARS syndrome and you know uh, we have a very nice uh, little commentary in, in clinical endocrinology on this and what the author suggested is that any severe physiological infection or stress like, like a COVID-19 can lead to activation of the HP axis. And once the infection or inflammation is resolved, the HP axis needs to be, you know, often gets down regulated. So the patient has been in a state of, of, you know, something like a patient of a Cushing syndrome, right? And you suddenly remove the tumor and the patient suddenly feels down, right? And the patient mentally feels worse and this is known as sickness syndrome. Right, sickness syndrome is also been seen with patients on glucocorticoids when it's been withdrawal suddenly. You know, treatment of Cushing syndrome, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and post-viral arthritis. These are some of the other sickness syndromes which are commonly seen in practice. And very interestingly, with SARS-CoV-1, 40% uh, of the patient had actual evidence of central adrenal insufficiency in their cohort. So it's it's very interesting, and this is something you know we should look at. Some of our patients who recover from a stormy course. You know, this could be one of the uh, problems they may suffer and, you know, it would be a good idea to seek help of an endocrinologist at this point of time. Uh, also, some patients were found to have lymphocytic hypophysitis. This is a very interesting uh, pituitary disorder. It's like Hashimoto's of the pituitary gland. And lymphocytic hypophysitis has been reported secondary to SARS-CoV-1 
uh, again not been reported because of SARS-CoV-2 so far but you will see some cases in future so it is again something you need to keep take care of again clinical features sometimes you know an MRI can show a, a, a enlarged pituitary gland something like an adenoma you know so again you need to seek the help of an endocrinologist to sort of make the correct diagnosis what about the thyroid gland uh, important audience poll uh, and those who attended one of my earlier lectures on this would know the answer to this what is the most common form of thyroid dysfunction attributed to SARS-CoV-1 again I repeat it's about SARS-CoV-1 and not SARS-CoV-2 was it thyrotoxicosis was it hypothyroidism or was it central hypothyroidism and again uh, you would have been given options to answer this and of course we'll be discussing the results in the end okay so uh, you know one important disease we should expect is subacute thyroiditis so far we have not seen a lot of cases uh, because of covid 19 but we might see cases in future and subacute thyroiditis is a common sequelae to viral infections you know it's a well known uh, uh, you know post viral syndrome and you know we uh, at this point of time we are seeing some reports from across the country from across india uh, of thyroid function tests which is suggestive of subacute thyroiditis so this is an unpub unpublished uh, sort of a expert opinion you can say right uh, however we are started to see some of these clinical pictures uh, and subacute thyroiditis is a very interesting uh, disorder you initially have a thyrotoxic phase followed by a brief hypothyroid phase followed by some in most cases a euthyroid phenomena right so this there is a sort of a triphasic phase uh, and again we should you know the symptoms of in thyrotoxic phase are very similar to any other cause of thyrotoxicosis like graves disease for example where you have weight loss fever tremors and pain and tenderness of the thyroid gland and this pain is very typical often radiates to the ear and you know a lot of patients are give a classical history in this sense uh, in lab investigations they'll show thyrotoxicosis elevated t3 t4 with a reduced tsh but remember all thyrotoxicosis is not graves disease this is especially important in today's era of viral infections where you should know that subacute thyroiditis is an important cause of thyrotoxicosis so don't start carbimazole or methimazole in all patients with thyrotoxicosis in the first go you first need to determine the etiology and then consider the following treatment uh, you can do a simple thyroid scan which can show a reduced tracer uptake and of course you know you'll have elevated esr uh, and crp and tsh receptor antibody would be negative uh, the treatment is mainly symptomatic you need to give beta blockers NSAIDs if you have fever and if the patient of course continues to have symptoms you can give a short course of glucocorticoids and the patient often becomes better of course you will have other thyroid issues viral infections can trigger autoimmune phenomena like Hashimoto's and Graves disease in as a sequelae and you know from SARS-CoV-1 patients autopsy finding did show that there was impact on the thyroid gland and the thyroid follicular architecture was damaged so there is potential that SARS-CoV-2 also can lead to this okay another audience poll uh, a, a patient comes to me with reduced t3 and t4 with a normal tsh what does it suggest does it suggest a lab error uh, you know uh, does it suggest central hypothyroidism or does it suggest primary hypothyroidism okay so uh, we'll go on you can answer this at your convenience and we'll have a look at the answers in the end so one of the most common thyroid function abnormality and this was the earlier question uh, with sars cov one was central hypothyroidism where there was a reduced t3 reduced t4 with either reduced normal or mildly elevated and mildly i mean up to level of 10 uh, this type of thyroid function was very common in sars-cov-1 and this was suggestive of central hypothyroidism so sars-cov-1 very interestingly led to impaction of the pituitary gland leading to central hypothyroidism rather than primary hypothyroidism in the first go so central hypothyroidism was commonly reported likely probably because of lymphocytic hypophysitis we are not very sure but again this is something you can watch out for in your patients who present uh, after the you know infection has resolved uh, non thyroidal illness or sick euthyroid syndrome picture may be very common in patients uh, who present with uh, you know viral pneumonia and again a lot of critical care guys would be very well aware about uh, this this condition it needs no treatment uh, you know but again something you know we need to watch out uh, what about the adrenal gland and you know there will be a lot of patients with pre-existing adrenal insufficiency uh, in such patients you need to follow the sick day rules and you need to increase the dose of steroids when they become infected uh, you know this is the endocrine society recommendation for this if the patient comes with dry continuous cough and fever you should immediately double the dose of their oral glucocorticoids so if the patient has been taking let's say hydrohyzone 10 milligram in the morning 5 milligram in the afternoon you need to increase it to 20 and 10 right so you need to double the dose uh, as soon as the patient presents with clinical symptoms 
again uh, patients may be given glucocorticoids because of the treatment and if given for a prolonged time and not tapered can lead to central adrenal insufficiency another reason why you can have central adrenal insufficiency here and patients on long standing glucocorticoids like again this is where you know pulmonologist meets an endocrinologist a lot of patients of yours would be on glucocorticoids either inhaled agents or oral agents or some other form and the hp axis needs to be assessed in these cases if they develop infection remember inhaled glucocorticoids especially fluticason can also and and some of the other potent inhaled glucocorticoids can lead to hp axis suppression so please keep this in mind there are a lot of studies both in children as well as in adults this can be something which you need to watch out for okay a uh, very interesting audience poll question and very simple answer right overall who do you think has worse prognosis with covid-19 men or women and let me give you a hint right the nature doesn't like men right that is for sure and you know uh, i think that i've given away the answer right so there is a link between androgens and covid-19 and how do we know this this is a very fresh off the press study and this is very interesting so this is a study where you know they compared patients with prostate cancer they compared those who were on androgen deprivation therapy versus other you know forms of therapy and you know overall uh, we know that if you see the data across the board males develop more severe infections they are more frequently hospitalized and had worse clinical outcomes than in females uh, in this study specifically what they found was that patients who were on androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer had four times lesser risk of developing sars cov2 infection compared to those with prostate cancer not on adt right this is very very interesting now this could be because of a very interesting co receptor which is tmp rss2 right now we talked a lot about ace2 but there is a co receptor also for the virus to enter and which is tmp rss2 now why this is important because tmp rss2 gene is up regulated by androgens who has androgens males right so this is one of the major issues right hence men are perhaps more vulnerable than women for sars cov2 infection as well as the risk of death also may be higher because of the higher viral load uh, again something very interesting right very interesting study and i i i'm really shocked that you know people are really thinking to this level with covid-19 uh, the clinical characteristics of results of semen analysis in men with coronavirus this was a study done in china so what they did was they took semen analysis of patients who were either having an acute active infection or had resolved from it and 15% of the patients with covid-19 are likely to have virus detected in the semen of course this is men right this also includes patients who are recovering uh, so you know i mean what it means is that virus actually you know survives in the semen right so does that make you know sars cov2 a sexually transmitted virus uh, uh, you know like the many others uh, you know i leave it for you to answer this so can can covid-19 be sexually transmitted remember this was also seen in patients who had recovered so the patient recovers goes home and can he then transmit the infection to his partner which is something which you you know have to think about it you know and probably you know have a lot of sleepless nights uh, vitamin d and covid 19 uh, again you would see you know sometimes you see a lot of uh, data in the press you know uh, if you just google this you will find about 10 or 20 newspaper articles about this you know you not find newspaper articles about ace 2 levels and other things but you will find a lot of newspaper articles about vitamin d and this is a study uh, which actually generated all this uh, you know uh, 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 you know newspaper articles in the lay press uh, the possible role of vitamin d in suppressing cytokine storm and mortality in covid-19 patients and vitamin d level uh, vitamin d is very well known to enhance innate immunity and suppress adaptive immunity again i told you i'll talk a lot about innate immunity and vitamin d enhances innate immunity and suppresses adaptive immunity and you know this is this is this chart uh, is taken from one of the endocrinology textbooks right so this is not something which is which is which is a uh, new it's a well known concept uh, which has been around for a long time and you know uh, uh, so clearly there is an enhancement of innate immunity with vitamin d and when you have better innate immunity and less adaptive immunity you have a reduced risk of developing cytokine storm so vitamin d theoretically reduces the risk of cytokine storm uh, several previous studies have shown that vitamin d level have a inverse relationship with crp levels that means higher vitamin d and lower crp and vice versa uh, so you know of course i'd like you to see this paper i would not give my judgment on this though i do feel that this paper is little bit by conjecture and and it's not a not a great 
piece of research but i still say you know are you convinced about the benefit of vitamin d in covid 19 and if you are you should consider treating your patients giving them vitamin d and making them more uh, replete uh, but again you know uh, i i look forward to your answer on this okay so i i end my lecture with some important take home messages for you the first is about diabetes remember diabetes can increase the risk of covid 19 related mortality uh, and morbidity the virus itself virus itself can for its own survival produce hyperglycemia increasing ace2 levels and hence increasing its own uptake which is very interesting uh, ace2 and angiotensin 2 play a crucial role in covid 19 more research should be generated in this area and i think pulmonologists and endocrinologists need to get together to research this area because this is something which which is true pulmonology uh, subacute thyroiditis is a possible sequelae of virus all thyrotoxicosis is not graves disease and does not merit treatment with carbamazole and methimazole so if you have a patient presenting with thyrotoxicosis evaluate and then treat uh, central hypothyroidism was commonly reported with sars cov 1 possibly because of lymphocytic hypophysitis we still don't have a lot of papers on this but you know we might see this and you know you need to keep your eyes and ears open for this uh, sick day rules for patients already having adrenal insufficiency on glucocorticoids you need to follow sick day rules double the dose if they do develop infection in fact double the dose when they develop early signs of infection and are you know these are some important questions with which i don't have clear answers to it uh, you know uh, we need to see more data for it a are males were vulnerable to virus you know does vitamin d really help and can sars cov to be a sexually transmitted disorder not just a uh, you know a respiratory condition uh just some other papers i'd like you to look at uh, this is one by dr sanjay kalra and dr atul kalan both of whom are actually my mentors uh, and and you know uh, uh, this is in touch endocrinology the link is given below uh, another very interesting paper from dr deep datta uh, you know uh, from delhi and and this is about covid 19 and metabolic syndrome and an association too difficult to ignore so again i have the link below and you can you know read it for your interest thank you i wish you stay safe and you know uh, i hope really that we stop doing webinars and start start doing live meetings very soon uh, you know i am craving for that you know and and looking forward to